Hey everybody and welcome back to BK's Bullets. Today we're going to be reviewing Batman 3 Jokers. Hey everybody and welcome back to BK's Bullets. As always, I am your host Brent Casina, and today we're going to be talking about Batman 3 Jokers. So I did a hardcover overview on the channel already. I read this before a little bit when it was coming out and I finally sat down and read it all the way through as one story. So let's talk about it. What do I think? Well, I don't know if this is going to be spoilers or not, honestly. There's a lot of stuff to talk about in this book. So let's just say it's going to be spoilers. So if you don't want to know what's happening or don't want to hear my review about it until you've read it, come back later and bookmark this video and come back after that. So all gone? Are you back? Whatever it is, thanks for coming back. So Three Jokers, what is this book, right? This is the long-awaited book, the long-taunted, the long-teased, the long revelation that we thought we were going to find out who the Joker was, finally. We thought this was going to be an origin story for the Joker, or at least a reveal of his identity, or who these guys were, or why there were three of them in the first place. Do we get any of that? No. Smartly so. I think uh, where Wolverine origin kind of failed to tell a, a nice origin story for Wolverine, this one uh, kind of leaves it all to chance and treads heavily on Batman the Killing Joke, by uh, Alan Moore and other stories that have come before as well. The cool thing about the Joker, and this, which is like the same thing about Wolverine, is that he's a mystery. Uh, he can be whatever the writer wants him to be at the time. He can be a master class criminal. He can be a clown. He can be a comedian. Uh, and those are the three Jokers that we focus on here in this book, and that's kind of what they call them. They all call themselves the Joker, but Really, we refer to them as the criminal, the clown, and the comedian. So, basically, this book starts out, there's a bunch of people dying all over. The Joker's been spotted multiple places, and Batman, Batgirl, and Red Hood, who are our protagonists in this story, revolves around them because all three of them have a relationship with the Joker. Batgirl was shot in Killing Joke. Um, Robin was killed at the hand of the Joker in death of the family and Batman is of course Batman he's got a connection to all these people so we're finding out what's happening with the Joker alongside all these characters and we're treading on all those past histories as well we're having flashbacks to Batman and uh, you know how many battles he's fought how many battles he's fought with the Joker Red Hood is having flashbacks to the day he died so to speak Barbara is having flashbacks from the day she got paralyzed in her spine um, you know, they're all go reliving this trauma as they're fighting the Jokers. And it seems like they're all reliving this trauma every time they fight the Joker. Because he is the worst of the worst in terms of bat villains and stuff like that. Um, so it's a really nice thing that Jeff Johns has done, kind of like tying all this trauma together. And with Bruce, it takes three books to get there. But we're reliving his trauma with Joe Chill. The difference is where... Batgirl and Red Hood get mad at the Joker and kind of take out their anger on them, uh, on the Jokers here. Bruce is reliving his trauma with Joe Chill and actually saves his life and kind of almost heals that wound. And Joker makes a point at the end of the book saying, I healed your wound, so now I am the, I can be your only thing you care about. Uh, I am the only sore, the gaping wound that you have left me, the Joker. Uh, because he wants to be the one thing that Batman thinks about all the time. And even in this book, when the three Jokers, they do talk to each other. Uh, you know, they uh, one of the criminal, who's like the mastermind, this guy in the middle here, says that Batman is the only thing that matters. Torturing Batman is the only thing that matters to them. So, that's that. So, what are the three Jokers trying to do? Well, they're trying to create a fourth one. Have they ever created a fourth one? We don't know. We think so. It's not clear. Um, you know, the whole, like, Scott Snyder Joker with the face coming off and then Endgame with his head being shaved halfway and just having, like, this green mohawk. All this stuff is not explained at all. It's not really meant to be explained. 
Um, this, I think, could be a definitive Joker tale, um, but also it could not be canon as well. It could be considered like an Elseworlds, even though it is a, a DC Black Label book. Um, it says it down here. It's very, it's very, very violent. It's a very scary Joker story. Um, I think it depends on where, how successful the book is, you know, and certainly there were people talking about it when it came out, the first book, but by the third, I think the conversation had died down a bit about it because it did not do what people were hoping it would do and it didn't do what, um, you know, it teased it would do for like the last five years. We were get, hoping for a definitive Joker origin story or at least give a good reason why there were three Jokers other than what we got in here. And, and what we got in here is a, it's a fine reason. It's a story reason. Um, but going back to Wolverine, it's smart to do it this way because you're not ruining the Joker for other readers. You're not ruining the Joker for other writers. Nobody has to slavishly... Um, refer to this if they want to do another Joker story. They can ignore it altogether. They can tie elements into it. They can do whatever they want with it. It leaves it open. And I think that's smart of Jeff Johns and smart of DC to go about this story this way um, because it gives them the, the most flexibility. And at the same time, it does give them a nice little story here um, to talk about how there are different interpretations of the Joker and why none of them are incorrect, basically, because the Joker can always create another one. And that can be the newest interpretation that's going on, whether it's Joker War in Batman right now, or the Joker in Scott Snyder's version. You know, all these different things can exist at the same time because now we have three Jokers that create other Jokers to fight Batman. Um, so that was a little interesting. I thought the, the versions of the Joker were interesting. I didn't really see the difference between the clown and the comedian. I definitely see the difference between the criminal and the other ones. But to say one is a clown and that's the one who killed Jason and the comedian is the one who shot Barbara, to me, maybe they're kind of the same Joker other than like, you know, one was drawn by Brian Bull and the other Jim Apparel, right? I don't know. Um, and they, they do in the first book when you see all three of them together, they draw them as you think of them, basically. Uh, with Joker in his Hawaiian shirt and um, the other Joker in his garish uh, purple costume that he beat up Robin in. And the comedian's also wearing purple. But there's a little pa panel at the bottom here. They're all talking to each other. So there's I killed Robin Joker. Here's I shot Barbara Joker. And then here's the the criminal. This is like the original Joker. And Jason Fabok does a wonderful job in this book. Let us not forget to sing his praises um, does a wonderful job in this book of bringing all these different versions of Joker to life, referencing the older artists that brought them to life at the same time, while tying it all together in his signature style. It is truly, truly wonderful to look at this book because you can see Brian Boland in here when you look at the Hawaiian shirt version of the Joker when he's dressed that way. You can see um, Dave Gibbons with the Watchmen panel out, and I think Brian Boland used that also in The Killing Joke, so maybe... Uh, it's leaning a little bit more on that format as well to to reference Killing Joke rather than Watchmen, but you can also see like w this picture of the of the criminal Joker, right? Um, it looks very reminiscent to like one of the early drawings from I don't know if it was Jerry Robinson, I think. Um, you know, like going back to the nineteen forties when he was drawn a certain way and wasn't so smiley, but was like really menacing. That's there, too, in this style. And Jason Fabok does a wonderful job across the entire book. I think this is the best Red Hood, Red Hood has looked since his inception. Like, this is not the definitive Red Hood story. Obviously, that's under the hood. But this might be the definitive Red Hood look for a long time coming in terms of detail, wonderfulness, and just consistency across the board. Um, it makes it very clear that, like, Red Hood has a mask on his hood. Like, he's got these little, um, things around the eyes to make it look like Spawn or something like that, maybe. So, Jason Fabok is my age, so he's probably very influenced in the 90s from Todd McFarlane's, all that things. Um, the only nitpick I have with his Red Hood design is that there's one part when they're in the aquarium in issue one 
where Red Hood lifts up his his hood like a visor, like Iron Man does does in the movies, and that's the only time he does it in the book. And every other time he's taken off his hood, his helmet in the book, it acts like a helmet. It's like one solid piece, and he's lifting it up off of his head. So it's one little nitpick. Like, what is it? Let's make up our minds here. But all that aside, I think it's a fantastic piece of art. These this hardcover. Uh, these three books from Jason Fabok and let's not forget Brad Anderson the colorist um, I don't there's no inker here I think Jason Fabok either does his all his own inking or he's digital I believe he's digital uh, a digital artist so he does all the you know inking and stuff when he's drawing it himself on the computer I know he does like some covers and stuff traditionally most of the you know so it's got to have some sort of like secondary art to sell but, um, you know, it just makes sense. But Brad Anderson does a wonderful job on the colors here. Very moody, very good job, um, very consistent. No complaints here. So, you know, all in all, I think this is a, a really kind of a, a neat story. Um, I wouldn't go out and recommend it to say it's a definitive Batman story, mainly because there's a lot of stuff you have to read to really understand what's going on here. It treads a lot on the stories from before, especially Death in the Family and Killing Joke. Uh, and you have to know who the Red Hood is, what his story is, how he came back to life. You have to know Barbara and her history as Oracle and everything she's gone through. It's not really an easy pickup um, in terms of a new reader. You know, I think they might have difficulty. While they might appreciate the story and they're going to love the art, uh, I think they're going to have difficulty kind of understanding the magnitude of it and the layering in also of Joe Chill in book three um, is just, you know, it. you need a, to be an experienced reader, I think, to get the full effect of it, or at least read a lot of Wikipedia pages. So is it a new classic? Time will tell. I, I don't think so, not necessarily. This doesn't strike me in the way that I proclaimed Batman White Knight a new classic, um, and it doesn't really have the lasting you know, we'll see if it has a lasting impact of something like Dark Knight Returns. But uh, since this treads on so much older comics and previous works that are also great, I think it loses a little bit of that greatness itself in that it's not a um, wholly original story. I mean, it is the idea is original. We've been thinking about it for years. Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok have all be, obviously been thinking about it for years. Um, but it's not a, a new take on Batman or anything like that. It's a new take on the Joker, but you're taking all these other takes and just kind of combining them and, and molding them into one thing. So it's not like White Knight where it was an entirely new take on Batman and his rogues and um, the dichotomy of the Joker there. Uh, this is, you know, classic Joker, whereas that was like a new tw twist. So I don't think it's quite as good as that because of those reasons like you can read white knight just know who batman and the joker are and go from there absolutely you can't really read this going in cold you know you got to know these other characters and you got to know their histories to really understand what's going on here in fact there's a guy in the first issue i think his name is gabby or grabby and apparently he was the original sidekick of the joker and he gets he appears in the um yeah gaggy he's called He's this little little person right here up at the top. And um, it's funny, he appears opposite the shark because him and the shark have a meeting later in the book. And you never see from him again. I'm sorry, you see the shark ate him or whatever. It's just funny. Um, but apparently he was in one of the earlier Joker stories. And the fact that nobody remembers him has to be spelled out for you in the book. So it's it's typical Jeff Johns, I think, to to pull from older stories and, and craft something new and interesting. Uh, he just doesn't do it here in the way that he did with Green Lantern where he took something and switched it around and changed it and made it brand new and you didn't need to know a whole lot. You could just go, ooh, that's a cool idea and keep reading. Um, this treads a lot from older stories and I'm heading it again and again and again because it's true, again and again and again. It's true that many times. Um, the end of the story, I think, is very interesting in terms of where it leaves us with the Joker. Um, the idea that there is a family somewhere that Bruce thinks is the Joker's family, and 
it's kind of making the killing joke the definitive origin that even Alan Moore never really wanted it to be. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. I like the idea of maybe this is a family, but this is very definitive where it's like, you know, no, this is the Joker's family. And if anyone ever knew, their lives would be ruined because they're living in obscurity way up in Alaska. So I think that's a little strange thing to drop here just to have another secret that Bruce knows. Um, and he says it that he knew it the week after he met him, like early on when, in the Batman Adventures, when there was a moment in <laughs> Dark Side War in Justice League, I think issue 48 or whatever, whenever Batman sat on the Mobius chair, he had a idea of, I know who the Joker is now, or there's three Jokers, like, this idea that he knew all along when very clearly, like, according to the, to Jeff Johns' his own story, and Jason Fabok was the artist there. Um, I, I don't know if it jives, really. But if you just take it on its own, I think it's an it's a, it's a interesting little idea. But in terms of long term, um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. Um, are they going to return to the story? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. We'll see how well it sells, I bet. They... They do have an idea of where they think this is can go, Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok, apparently. But, um, you know, I don't know if they do need to. I don't know. This was a nice enough little story that, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't left craving for more when it ended. It had a nice little bow on it. Whereas you read White Knight or Dark Knight Returns, you want more immediately. And then you get it good with Curse the White Knight, you don't get it good with Dark Knight Returns again. Or Dark Knight Strikes Again. <laughs> um, so, not all sequels are great. Let's remember that in terms of Batman great stories. So, yeah. That's my review of Three Jokers. I think it's an interesting little story. Would definitely worth your time to read it if you haven't read any Jason Fabok before. Haven't experienced his art. It's phenomenal. It, like I said in the overview hardcover video I did, it's very clear that this is the only thing he's been working on for like four or five years because every single panel is perfection. It is like he poured over it with a fine-tooth comb and made sure every little angle was perfect. Every little line was definitively placed. Nothing is there by accident, and it's all very deliberate. Uh, and the pacing and the panel layouts are very deliberate, and it matches uh, you know, the story quite well. So is there a, a better example of a writer and an artist working together in concert that I've seen recently? Maybe not. Uh, this was, in terms of that aspect, fantastic. So, I think it's worth your time. It's worth checking out. Or at least, you know, pick up the first issue somewhere and see if you want to go from there. I don't think that's a bad idea if you want to figure out if you want to read the whole story. It's available digitally, you know, if you want to read the first issue that way and then decide to pick up the hardcover. Or you want to go to a local comic shop and see if they still have a copy. I'm sure they might have some. Um, after all, they printed the heck out of these things. Um, so yeah, that's my review of Three Jokers. Thank you guys for watching. Like, comment, share, subscribe. It helps the algorithm, helps the channel grow, and I will see you guys next time here in the Funny Pages.